you don't want a robust kind of dog at this time of the year. You want something that's in good command and sensible. But you also yeah. want a dog that'll catch a lamb if you can. Because yeah. if you've got a dog that'll catch a lamb, it can cause yeah. you a big lot of trouble. But both of them two will catch lambs. I'm Dave Baxter, and I've been a shepherd 50 years, and I live at Angry Harford. I went in here. It's a heathery place, and about 3,000 acres, something like that. It's hard sort of farm. I know practically every part of it. When I come here first, there was two of us here, and then one went, and I did it myself after that. And I left school when I was 15 and I went away to Shepherd when I was about 16, and I've been to Shepherd never since then. Well, in them days, they used to take on a sort of apprentice Shepherds, which they don't do now. Yeah, there's hardly anybody taking any young boys on Shepherd now. Oh, I think we're in a, a, an amazing period of change. There's been so many um, different things have happened in the last five to 10 years that have been uh, encouraged large and larger numbers of stock on the hills, particularly sheep. Um, but at the same time, the economics driving down the workforce, the numbers of people um, able to actually make their living in the hills. So we've seen a shift to bigger and bigger farms, fewer and fewer shepherds. The number of sheep per man's still a lot yet because one man's doing a two or three men's job now. It's really, it's just the way, the way it's went. 40 years or so ago, you would have had, certainly you would have had one shepherd to every, say, 500 ewes on the hill. Um, nowadays, you're talking about 1,000, 1,500, maybe even 2,000 ewes per shepherd. Well, there wasn't, everything wasn't in that big a hurry in them days, and there was more men and the farms, and every hill had a shepherd on it in them days. Now there's one shepherd to three or four hills now. Well, I can think of one uh, valley in the Cheviots where 40 years ago, probably even less than that, there were over 20 shepherds working in that one valley. Um, today, there's not a single full-time shepherd living in the valley. Um, there are two, um, a farmer and a shepherd, that actually cover that area. So, uh, an amazing change. Ten miles up the Cokert Valley from Angrihof lies one of the biggest farms in the area. It's staffed by two shepherds. My name's Stuart Wallace and I've been shepherding now for 27 years. We're right in the middle of lambing time now and I'm thoroughly enjoying every minute of it. Back when a lamb comes into the world, its front legs come with its nose end out that way. And it might be a leg back, it might be both legs back or it might be everything's there and it's just too big a lamp to come out and it needs a bit of help. So that's why really I'm employed to save them and up to now, I have done. Well, sheep's very much like human beings. You get good mothers, you get bad mothers. You get good lambs, you get bad lambs. You get good kids, you get bad kids. They're very much like human beings in a way. My name's Gwen Wallace and I've been um, shepherding full-time for 15 years. Uh, I come from Anglesey, North Wales, little island on top of Wales. But I wasn't um, born and bred on a farm. My mother's a farmer's daughter, but I, was, I never, you know, lived on a farm. And I remembered this job was advertised when I was in, in college, and I just thought, oh, I'll see if it's still available, and, and it was. She got the job and she moved in next door and I've never been one to splash out money when I go courting so I could easily walk next door without taking the car and I thought it was just as easy to marry her. <laughs> we walking next door then going miles away, driving the car miles away to find somebody else so <laughs> saved a bit of money there. <laughs> we do have arguments, which you have to, <laughs> but um, no we work, we work all right with each other. Um, the work always gets done. We might disagree with some things, but but we're not too bad. Gwen will be the youngest shepherd in the valley. 
and she'll be 36. There's not many young shepherds coming into the job now. The not many want to live up, out by. They're, they're far too keen of night clubbing and there's no night clubs about here. <laughs> Damn few anyway. Uh, the job just there's plenty of shepherding jobs going about if you look, but just not the young shepherds coming into the job now. Like so us, we're what 20 miles away from a supermarket, 10 miles away from petrol. The young ones don't much travel that distance now. I don't. Agree. I don't. I don't. It's right in the centre of the lemon as it, as we are now. The peak of the lemon. Lie down. The April. Lie down. Well, it's one of the busiest times, but it's quite nice when it's like weather like this. It's been a, a lot easier this time with the weather being good. Lie down. They're getting up and able to look after themselves more than any other years, you know. It's quite easier, a lot easier this time for them. It's like a harvest. It's just like a harvest. Well, she's, she's just suckling on one side of the lamb. She should have had two for the quantity milk she's got, but she's only got one. And she, if the lamb's not coping with it. So we'll have to drain her up for a day or two. Till she gets a hold of both sides. And not usually as much milk as this, man. It would end up in trouble if you didn't doctor her. But sometimes the lamb gets on suck on one side and doesn't want to suck the other side, you know. That's where half the problem sometimes lies with them. Like milk in a cow, this. I don't. I don't. That'll do. He's a little chap that can uh, can stand the bad weather. If the weather's good, you've got good lamb, and if the weather's bad, it's it's a bad time. I don't. A hill lamb can stand a lot, but they can't stand that much. Lambing time is is almost certainly the most stressful time of the year for any any shepherd. I don't. Um, I don't. And the weather not only at the time of lambing but um, at the time of tupping in the autumn and over the winter. Um, what condition the, the ewes were in at that time? Um, how they fared through the winter if there's, if there've been some hard periods of um, uh, difficult weather, snow, or cold, or whatever. Um, and then of course you come to the lambing itself, and it's a stressful time for the sheep. Um, and it's also an incredibly stressful time for the shepherd. That'll do. Well, she's had a dead lamb since her run this morning, and uh, it must have been lying uh, in the, smothered in the brat, as we see, as a, as a film across the nose. And, uh, if the ewe doesn't get up quick enough, it can kill the lamb, and that's what's happened there. I don't. Dave's solution to the problem is one practiced by shepherds for centuries. He strips the skin from the dead lamb and slips it, like a jacket, onto the live one. The aim to persuade the ewe to adopt the lamb as her own. It's called setting on. There we are now. There's your new lamb. If you, it's difficult to set them onto them hill ewes with the skin. There's other ways you can try it with dettol and there's, oh, there's a lot of different ways you can try it, but the, the skin's the most successful thing of the lot. She's a bit wary since the dogs has worked her. Go on, little lammy, in here, mammy. Go on. Come on, lammy. Well, she thinks it's her own lamb now. She's uh, quite, seems to be quite settled with it. And I, I think she'll be no bother by tonight. She'll be out and uh, away with them. Whoop. But I think she'll be OK. You do save quite a few lambs, but sometimes, you know, you've got to be there at the right time. Can't always be there 24 hours a day. You can miss them. 
but um, but there's a lot you do save. She had a pair of twins, but for some reason she just took a dislike to one of them. I don't know why. I can't I can't explain why they do that. And uh, she just didn't want it. She wouldn't let her suckle. So um, so I've, I've had to take it off, and then uh, we'll feed it. Get like powdered milk that we mix with warm water, and uh, similar to the mother's milk. I'm just helping it, just giving it a bit of um, a bit of nourishment. I've seen the lambs running around, playing around, because they're, they're great to watch lambs when they're young, playing around, chasing each other. Um, and sometimes you might recognise a lamb that you might have saved or had been awkward at lambing time. So that's, that's quite satisfying. The spring's quite nice, I. I like the I like to see the trees and the things come to life again. I think they're a marvellous bird the grouse. The black cock's always there in the spring. It seems to come back to the same place, the same lake every year. I think it's fascinating the way they display in that. I. They're just trying to reign supreme aren't they? Who's they going to be the best? I think that's the way of it. There's a lake on about every farm and that, and they come to the same places. No, oh, they're just nice to see. But you know, fret at lambing time, when things may wild scan wrong, twin up your yows that have got milk, for fear your twins will gone. And after that, there's nothing for but care the yows away. Just try the keel stick, hold our room, care them pay the grave. We get ticks here bad in the spring, and it's just about devour the lambs if you don't treat them. We didn't, in the olden days, you couldn't do them. We used to dip them in, in a bottle of dip, used to put them into the head. And, uh, but this modern stuff, it's, uh, it's tremendous stuff. They're just like a little mite that clings to the skin. That's blood suckers. And they grew to the size of your little fingernail. They're massive things when they drop off. But when one drops off, usually there's another half a dozen still there. That's a horrible little creature. Well, it takes two you want to hold them up and one to ply it that uh, each one gets done. You can't, you can't do them jobs on your own, really. I get Robert and a friend, and he comes and helps us to do it. Robert McKay. He works as a shepherd on another farm. We knew each other well since he was a little baby. He's come here since then. Right pleasant lad he is. You know, good hand with his sheep, he's really interested in them. He likes them. Oh, the shepherds of the Kirkut and the Alwyn and the Reed, the Beaumont and the Bremish, they are all the same breed. We is collie dog aside him and he stick with horn heed. That's the canny shepherd laddie of the hills. But I always was interested in the dogs right from a young age. I got it one when I was a boy, about 12, I got a one of an old shepherd that used to, I used to help the lamb when I was a boy called Willie Buchanan. And I got this dog of him, a dog called Don. And I thought he was the best dog I'd ever was, but he wasn't when, when I think back after what. Well, some folk can't get them, but I've never had any bother getting a dog to do my job with. 
I got a one when I was n 21, I think, called Sam. He was a great dog. He won a great lot of trials. In fact, I won six one season, six Saturdays run with him, which I've never done since. Not many other people's done it either. The Klemuta meang the heather, ere it's torn to break a deer, cross the peat, the bent the moss eggs, and the bergs will wend our way. Quick to catch a yow that's mackied, or a tup that's strayed away, that's the canny shepherd laddie of the hills. In the olden days, when I was first a youth running dogs, they used voice command, just one whistle to stop the dog at the top of the field or on the top end of the sheep and then they used voice commands all the way. <whistles> this whistling's just started in the, oh, this last 20 or 30 year. <whistles> when I was about in my early 20s, I got me, all my teeth taken out. I had to get them out. And I, I used to whistle my fingers. I could whistle tremendous with my fingers in. And then I, I couldn't whistle after I got my teeth with my fingers, so I had to take drastic action. So I made a, I concocted a bit of tin with a hole in that, and I could get the same tune as what I could with the whistling with the fingers. It was trying and error for a long time to get the the hole has to be filed down on the piece of tin to get the tune exactly right. I just did it myself in desperation, really, because I had to run my dog and trial and that, and I had to get the command right. But it's just the same, this whistling with this piece of tin with the hole in, it's just the same as whistling with your fingers. You have to put your tongue away in the right place to get the tune to come right. The same as with your fingers, you can turn it up or turn it down. And they uh, get that shrill, shrill kind of sound when you want it. The dog's hearing is very good, you know. It doesn't take a it doesn't take a, a shout and a roar at a dog to make it listen it. Well just learn them on the verbal commands first. And when you give them a verbal command to the left or the right, just follow on with the whistle to the left or the right. You've got a whistle for either side and a whistle to stop and a whistle to come on. And as they break away whichever side you want them off, just give them a little toot of the whistle and they'll soon pick it up. It's the way to learn them. It's not a secret, but I've never seen anybody else use it. Or I've never mentioned it to anybody. I just usually walk on the trail field, whip it out in my pocket and use it. And, and put it away before I come back. It's never a thing that's been discussed. Here's the litter, all eight of them. Oh, yes. Five dogs and three bitches. So there we are. Hmm. They're well reared anyway. Well, they got onto solid food fairly early, and they've never really looked back since then. Hey, Natalie, my granddaughter, she loves the dogs and things like that. We just come to pick the pup up, see which one we wanted, and uh, take it away. Pass that bitch, Natalie, there. I think it's a bitch. Yes, that's a bitch, David. They only... Got the fool. Yes, they are. Very pricky-eared bitch, that. And, uh, I really thought I would take a bitch one this time because I haven't got a bitch to breed off. The old bitch I had, I let her go because she was too old. And I thought I would have a bitch pup this time to breed off because it's a good background. I think if the bitch side's good on the background, you get a better chance of getting a good dog. This is like old Scott as a bean, this one. I'll just see what the sort of colours is in the mouth and that. It's just the thing I've always done. Grand strong legs I've got. Mm -hmm. Good bone. I don't like them with a lot of weight in my mouth. Never have. You don't want too gaudy a one. 
he want to buy a dealer here, he want a block of white one, you know. With the, but a lot of folk has tan in their dogs. But I'm not 100% keen on the tan. I like a black and white dog, really. <coughs> this particular litter is interesting in as much that um, it was quite difficult to get the mother, Jess, into pup in the first place. Um, she's very difficult to um, be absolutely certain when she's in season. And um, when she is in season, it's only for a short time. And when that is the case, you've got to get on your bike, so to speak, very quickly and go to the side that you've chosen for her. She's milked well, she's kept her condition well. She's, um, of course, at the prime age of her, her breeding um, age. She's just over five years old. So she's experienced and yet still quite young. Uh, but she's made a very good job of this litter. I think perhaps the best that I've, I've had from her, this being her third. So what do you think you'll call her? Well, when we come away, my and the wife said that we could... Uh, Meg was a nice name to call a pup. So what do you think of that, Natalie? I think it's a good name. It is a good name, isn't it? Yeah. I, I just like it. I think it's quite a nice pup. It isn't nervous at all, which is a great thing with a pup. If they're nervous, they never much cop, right away through life. They even should when they get old. And if they're nervous, they're always nervous, I think. So this one's not going to any nerve, I don't think. But it's quite a nice one. It'll it'll fit the bill, I think. I think it's a nice one. Uh, we'll give it a bit chance. It'll get a fair chance up there. Get a chance to get trained and worked on with. Good dog on a on a sheep farm is just like a joint over a hammer. It's it's a necessity. If you haven't got a good dog, you may as well just give it a bye. Clipping is a really important time of the year um, for all sorts of reasons. It's time to bring the, the sheep down from the hills. Obviously, you have to uh, they have to be clipped, but it's also a time to assess um, the flock during the year. It's a time when you can literally get a hold of each ewe and lamb and, and, uh, and see, see what condition they're in. No, I wouldn't see you know, every one of them, but you know most of them, where they belong in the farm. Oh, they're not stupid. It's, it's, it's a crafty old thing, a blacky ewe. She can dodge you or do anything. She's quite intelligent, I would say. Now some ewes are really nice types of ewes, you know, the kind mothers and and they're really nice ewes to work on with blackies. Big heavy three. Each farm's got its own mark. Just initial or a or a letter. Well it's for to tell you the age of the sheep which which year they were come into the flock and which which year they have to go out. It's best done at clipping time. That was the original time to do it. I thought they were tremendous in the machine when I first started. When they come out, I was on them straight away. I wasn't like I'm packing the blades up when the machine come on the scene. Well, we trained with hand shears when we were young lads, starting shearing. And I just like to do it to keep the tradition going, because there's not many does it now. They've got to be sharp. If they're not sharp, you cannot clip them. I just developed a method of mewing and stuck by it. In the neck and then down the note and then down the neck again, the other side. And finish at the tail both times. Well, they leave more wool on. A little bit more protection on a bad night. I remember Lynn Shields to this farm here, there used to be about 15 come to shear. And now there's just 
too. But it was tradition to come around and help your neighbours, see? And that was just the way it went on and on and on. In the past, um, it was quite a social event because there's, there's a lot of work to do in a relatively short period. Um, it was a, a, almost a necessity to bring more people in. And uh, in many cases, what you could do is you could start because of the way the seasons work and the way the weather conditions affect different parts of the, uh, of the valley. You could start lower down the valley and shepherds from higher up would come down and help with the, the, the flocks lower down. And gradually that whole group of shepherds would move up through the valley, uh, working together on each other's flocks, um, helping each other to, um, uh, to, to carry out the work. From those days, there used to be a big luncheon, tea and then supper when you finished. And, oh, I had a good crack. Them doers is gone. Never to come back. It's the biggest farm on the ranges. It's really two farms in one. It's Maked and, and Limebourne run as one unit, and it's in total about 5,500 acres, carrying a stock of just under 2,000. Mainly black faced ewes. My father and my grandfather both worked with sheep. When I was 14, my brother worked with my father in Lamentim. He got a bad dose of flu, and my father caught it as well. So I was sent out to help at Lamentim and working morning, noon, and night. And I got to stay off the school for two weeks with laminitis, as I called it. And I even got paid for it. So the bug bit then, and I've stayed with the sheep ever since. Riding at the deep end. <laughs> yes. <laughs> some dogs can't work together. Some, you know, always wants to do the job, or they get jealous of each other. So um, you just gotta kind of work out which dogs to take. Now it'd be nearly two years. It'd be September. We got married in the year 2000. Eh, uh, 1990. Sorry, feels like 20 odd years. <laughs> when I was in Wales, there wasn't many women working on farms then, unless they were farmers' daughters. It was, you know, very unusual. Um, but there's more, there's more women working on the farms now. Well, supposedly I'm in charge, but it <laughs> doesn't always work. We agree to differ some of the time. When we're putting sheep and lambs away at the hill, Gwen might think one's too young to go out, and I'll say, it's decent enough weather, get it out, it's far better on the hill than in the fields. I think we just kind of discuss things, see what he says, what his opinion is about it, and see if we agree, and I think sometimes you just might want a second opinion. Oh, it gets, always gets done. It might take a bit longer, odd time, but it always gets done. It's not easy to win dry it? because there's a fair bit of competition. A lot of people think it's just easy to go away and win a trail, but it isn't. That's a good lot. That's a good lot, quiet. Stand and wait another dog coming. There's been dog trials on for over 100 years yeah. in this country. Go down. And uh, they're getting better all the time, getting more professional. They're trying to make the border collie better so they can handle the sheep at home on the farm better. My name is Ray McPherson. I've won the national, the international twice, and the world championship twice. I've won two television championships, and I've also won uh, four international driving championships. The first thing is the outrun and they have to go in a pear-shaped out front to be preferably, you know, not too wide at the start. Widening as they go out. And they shouldn't stop short at the top, they should go round to the balance of the sheep, whatever that may be, maybe past them or short of them, depending. But if the sheep are in the right position, they should be just at 12 o'clock right behind the sheep, and they should lift them gently and steadily with a bit of feeling for the sheep and bring them down the field as straight as possible. Next is the drive. Turn them around your back and you dry them for 150 yards and uh, through the obstacle and back to the pen. Good command on the dog, 
So he handles the sheep better, easier for the handler, and uh, eat better for the sheep. You can run off either hand. You can come up off the left or the right. Some varies. See, one lot of, one dog may run best off the right hand, another one run best off the left hand, and that's just up to the individual handler. A lot of dogs can do it fairly well on their own if they're well schooled and well trained and well balanced, but they need commands at times, no matter what dog it may be. You get some that's needing commands all the time and can do a fairly good run, but it's uh, a run that will be downpointed by the judge if there are too many commands. There is a slow deterioration in the type of dog that's being bred, and it's much more difficult for people to get a dog that will last the pace. I think it's rather sad in a way because um, in the valley I live there were probably around 30 shepherds 15 years ago and now they're down to two and it was the shepherds that made the border collie what it is today with their careful breeding program they improved it and nowadays a different type of dog is being bred to the one the shepherds bred everyone wants trial winners and um, the trial winner in the lowlands doesn't get tested the same way as the hill dog does. The uh, principal objective, of course, for sheep dogs is, uh, is herding sheep. And it's just really a, a relatively small number that actually make the grade to uh, that higher grade up to um, the, the trial field. But trying to achieve that, of course, is, is very interesting. I don't keep them unless they're good at the top. And I want to win with them. That's the sole object of the, the getting the poop. Scott will maybe do that. <laughs> he's getting that way now. He's wanting to win it all. Everybody does. Lay down, lay down here. Lay down. Let me get. Let me. Lay down. Lay down. Lay down. Lay down. Everybody has their own way of training dogs, and there's no sort of set way of doing it. Um, you have a basic format but you've got to sort of try to look at each individual dog because they have their own characteristics. Some dogs have very strong personalities and you have to deal with that, whereas others are quite timid, but uh, given the course of time, they certainly come out and, and uh, do a very good job indeed. Any two that make the dog do it. Right. Some people are terrified when they get no. out there that they get no. started. No. No apologies. <laughs> I expect you to do well. That's that's just the top and bottom of it. But no pressure whatever. Face good! Face good! It's unpredictable what happens at these dog trails. Very unpredictable. It's all judged on time and points in time. Yep. You've got to get finished. But on the other hand, you can't hurry it because if you hurry it, your sheep just starts flying everywhere and your run's not very good. Come by, Scott. Come by, Scott. Scott, Scott. Scott, Scott. And there's the funny things, mule sheep. That's very unpredictable what they'll do. Some, some sheep, they just walk away and toddle away in front of you. Some of them do it. It's... The sheep has a fair bit to do with it. Come we, come we. The one that gets the best sheep and the best room wins. That's all that's to it. It's fair for everybody. A lot of luck in dog trialling. Depends when you run. Sometimes the morning sheep are best, sometimes at night they're best. Sometimes even through the day there can be a spell when they're good. But it's just the luck, you see. And if you're not prepared to take the luck as it comes, whether it be good or bad, you should stop trialling. Wait a minute. Well, the dog didn't just hear right. I think it must be in the, the sort of lay of the field. He didn't listen right, quite right. 
I missed a set of gates when when uh, he should have been listening. But I don't think he was hearing properly, because usually he's a good listener. And the sheep was quiet, uh, had the sheep going well. But it just happened. There's a little bit uh, wind, wind from that wood, it echoes, you know. And it's the same every year. It's, and as the wind gets up a bit, it gets worse. But he should have listened, but he didn't. That's the way it goes. I'm Alistair Anderson, and I'm chairman of the Rossbury Traditional Music Festival. It's a yearly festival that we uh, meet there in July, and people come from, mainly from roundabout, but they, they do come from, from all over the place to, just to enjoy and share music, making music and sharing it, that's what it's all about. It, it's just uh, getting uh, music in, in the whole of Corgut Valley uh, enlivened and uh, hopefully enriched, uh, stimulating the, uh, the older traditional music of, of that area that, that's, that's always been strong. Uh, but especially getting uh, youngsters going, just, just getting people aware of the music and, and providing opportunities for people to enjoy it. There's no doubt that uh, throughout uh, the last century, and especially since from the 1950s, uh, the, the rural areas were uh, uh, places where this sort of music really kept going very strongly, and amongst those were many shepherds. So I've passed through the dog trail many times and stopped and had a, had a bit loop paints and a bit of music to listen to. Oh, I like the Scottish dance music and things like that. And country and western. I like any kind of music, really. There's some good musicians among them. Very good musicians. There are still a number of shepherds and people from the, the hill farming community that uh, can sing a good song or recite a poem uh, or perhaps even just tell a story. Um, there are some particularly notable examples. Graham Dick, for instance, who was born and bred in, in the Corkett, um, now farms shepherds just outside of the area. Um, He's a wonderful singer. Um, his his singing has has developed and grown over uh, over a number of years. Now the songs about our soldiers and our sailors by the score, and the tinkers and the tailors, or the men by galore. But I'll sing you a wee bit ditty that you've never heard afore. Of the canny shepherd laddie of the hills. I like to sing a lot of the old traditional songs, uh, shepherd songs that's been handed down from generations. Um, and I've, well, I've been singing them for a lot of years now. The Canny Shepherd Laddie, it's, um, it's, it's a well-known traditional song. Like it's, It has been handed down, um, and it's the one I particularly like because it fits in um, with my work and my job. And the songs is, is a pattern throughout the Shepherd's year. Now he sends the dogs out run the sheep with cows have gone out wide and whistle way in earth so shrill the dog claps in his stride come by here moss lie down a bit or I'll stick your dusty hide that's the canny shepherd laddie of the hills A lot of the younger generation uh, don't seem to be interested so you know that would be my only worry like that, that these um, these songs would die out, but uh, as long as I'm alive, I'll try and keep the tradition going. That's the canny shepherd laddie of the hills. That's the canny shepherd laddie of the hills. Back at Dave's home in Upper Cokerdale, there's plenty to occupy Meg, the collie puppy recently bought. Although less than three months old, she's already showing a sheepdog's instinct to round up anything in sight. 
and Dave's happy with her. Oh, I think she's quite a nice bitch. She's short couple, she'll stand a lot of run. Short back runs are like a short back horse that last longer and more stamina, I think. Well, she was a bit stupid and I'd just left her in the kennel for a while and then I took her for the interview her with the sheep once or twice and then she one night or oh, about a month since for three weeks since she just started to shoo eye and pull herself together a bit. But she's a bit silly yet. But oh that's me or nothing. She just needs steadying up and pulling together. But at the time will do that when she gets older. When she settles down a bit. You have to be firm with them all and and them pet on at them and that. Lie down, lie down. You see people clapping on at them and, lie down. and then it just lie breaks their concentration that. If you tell them to do something right and then you start clapping on to them, they'll not know whether they've done it right or done it wrong then. I think you want to be firm with them and just leave them at that. Well, she'll grow big enough for a bitch. She's quite long legs and biggish feet, so I think she'll come okay. She'll grow to the size we need her. Some of the, the sort of more informal social evenings um, are important in terms of just, again, that social cohesion, a chance for people to meet um, and uh, perhaps talk over little issues, things that have cropped up during the last week or so. They're probably more common now than they used to be because of uh, transport, access to transport. People are able to get out of the farms and, and, and come down the valley um, to, to the pubs um, lower down. So something like a, a domino evening, um, a darts evening, something like that, uh, very important. All part of the, that, that sort of community life. Um, to people maybe from the more urban areas, it seems a fairly simple life, um, but I think it's, uh, it's important as just a, a chance to meet up again. The next one's David, Gabby and Neil. Oh, well, everybody met up with you, everybody in the olden days, and you ate a great lot of mutton, and, and that was it. Well, there used to be a chief at Gavin and things like that in the old days. There'd be one in most parts. And you used to gather your stray sheep up and take them and meet everybody at the point. And then you got your own sheep shed out and you went away home with them. Oh, there would be a drink or two. There's a night over on the Scots side at Hunnam. In the beginning of December they have a, a domino championship. And there's some tremendous prizes in offer. I mean, I can remember going back 20 years ago, going there, the first prize was a sheep for the freezer. Because that was a lot of money's worth. In them days, shepherds used to go and visit each other, but with the advent of television, do I say, and modern transport, they don't visit each other as often as they used to. Uh, they're, they're more inclined to go for a night at the pub rather than go and see their friend over the hill. We've got to be jack of all trades out here. Shepherd, you have to be a little bit of a vet. Um, fencer, tractor driver. Quad bike rider, you name it, it's, you've got to be able to turn your hand to anything nowadays. Going back to the early 60s, there used to be seven shepherds here, well now it's just me and my wife. So everybody helped each other in them days, so it didn't take as long as it does now, right? But you could gather, three men could go away and gather one hill, three men could go away and gather another hill, and you know, it didn't take as long as it does now. You need good dogs that will run out and think for themselves. I mean, a lot of the time my dog's working out of sight of me. I'm hoping it's doing what it should be doing. <laughs> it's a lot of us hope as well. It doesn't usually happen that way. <laughs> like everything that shepherds do, of course, the skill that's required there is, is really quite something. 
Um, gathering is another time to, to bring all the sheep together to, to uh, address any problems or um, issues that you might have with the flock, but also just to see what it is that you've got that year, what, what's the harvest like. Um, so a very important time of year and a very skillful thing to do. We'll gather for taking lambs off, marking lambs for the seals, we'll gather for injecting the, the ewes before lamb and tame, we'll gather for lamb and tame itself, uh, we gather for marking the lambs after that, then we gather for clipping the hogs, and we gather for clipping the ewes, and you're back round the square one, gathering to put the tops out. Very tiring. I mean, these motorbikes have helped a little bit. I mean, my dogs have all them ride in the back of the bike. Even going up the, over the hill, they'll sit in the back if I tell them to. It saves them a little bit. He has the motorbike. He does. He kind of, he kind of gets them, gathers them for me, and we get them all gathered up. And I usually bring them down the burn. Well, he usually shouts the same there over there and I can't see them and I go where they are and we start, um, he starts shouting at me. <laughs> but we get the sheep eventually. As long as you can put a dog back on this ground, you know, you're not too bad. Ask it to go back, stop what it's doing and go further back. It's, well, that's one of the main things you need in a dog out here. Usually the whistle, if it's like a bit of a windy day, um, the whistle is you know, a lot sharper and uh, uh, usually near at hand we use the voice and uh, from a distance we use the whistle. You've got to have kind of dogs that can kind of go blind, they say, you know, go... I think usually they can smell them as well, like the sheep once they get nearer. But if you can see them, you can kind of guide the dog, you know, to them. Further down the valley, one of the next generation of sheepdogs is rapidly learning the ropes. She's still less than five months old. Meg's progress is really good, pleasing good. her master. Oh, I think she's got a great potential. I think she'll make a great and do a great lot of good things, I think. Because she's any amount of power on sheep and she comes right up to them. And that's a thing you can't get in a young pup, but nowadays hardly. They usually lie in the way back, showing a lot of eye and never budging. And you have to cook something to get them to come up to sheep. This one, you have to stop it. Well, I, when I take her out, you need an older dog to keep the sheep in, in, in close quarters, you know, because they don't want to get away. She has been away with the men, and she just wears them up. She doesn't uh, dive in and worry them or anything. She doesn't attempt to do that. She just wears them up. But you better wear an older dog to hold them up when you go with a pup. Because she's literally just a pup, yeah. Meg! 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 Oh, I, I intend to breed pups of her. That's what I intend to do. Meg! I intend to breed pups of her. Where do we, Scott? Oh, I'm pleased with her. She's coming a quite nice bitch. She could have done with less weight on her, but you can't help her. seals is on and the ram seals is on selling the drug yells and things like that there's a bit of action then and you see everybody and i think that's a nice time of year autumn time is the is the time to uh, to take your your stock to market um, the sales themselves have been incredibly important um, for many generations and uh, again it's a time for those hill shepherds to bring their, their flocks down from the hills to the market towns and villages that, that sort of circle the Cheviot Hills.
I thoroughly enjoy the day out. You get to meet folk that you only see once a year sort of style. Wait, well, it depends how many sales you go to. You get a good crack with your mates, you see what the sheep's making. I'll usually help a lot of my brothers sell at Bellingham and anybody else. I know if they want a hand, I'll give them a hand because they'll, I know fine if I asked them if I was selling lambs, they would drop everything and help me, so. You don't want them jumping on top of each other and things like that. And you don't want too many in a pen. You want them so they have got room so that it doesn't clap the coats, as we call it, you know, so they don't get tightened up with the coat. They want to have a bit spread. Wash their faces and colour, put a bit of colour on them. Artificial colour, sort of camouflage them in one way and another, and a bit of oil on the head, put a bit of shine on their face, make them look healthy. The element of competition at the Mart is, is uh, very important um, in many ways. It, uh, it's important commercially, of course, but it's important for the, the pride of the individual shepherd. How well the shepherds were able to dress the sheep and, and produce a good turnout on the day was incredibly important both to the, um, to the eyes of the, the neighbours and the, um, the friends, but more importantly to the buyers. And uh, it's also an awful lot of skill in terms of how you actually present the sheep on the day within the market ring itself. What you're striving for is to produce as good a lamb as you can. And that's your show place as the mart. And the best price you can get, hopefully get the best price you can get. Somebody always has to go into the ring and turn the lambs round. Makes it much easier if there's a pretty face in the ring. <laughs> you get a penny or two more, or a pound or two less, I'm not sure which. <laughs> Some people can do it so well, just the just touch of, of, of a stick um, can just keep that moving and what you need is to have that carousel of, of sheep just moving quietly around, showing off the best, the best animals, um, eliciting the best, the best deal on the day. The draft used is usually sold in lots of 50. Sometimes 100, you know, but usually they split them into 50s. Now, well, the idea being you could see each sheep individually, really the time they were in the ring, because you've got to look at everything. Oh, I put 50s enough in the ring. But I've seen, I've seen uh, at them big sales, I've seen them coming in the ring and, and, and going out the ring and still coming in. A big drove of lambs. I've seen 200, 150 lambs come through the ring at once. What, on the, uh, sort of on the face of it, appears a very simple task of just pushing a few animals into a ring and circling them around while the, the uh, buyers uh, bid is actually technically very skillful. Getting the best animals on the outside of the ring so they're the ones that people see, perhaps hiding the, the, the individual that didn't do quite so well that summer. The buyers usually see all the faults. They usually, and you shouldn't really be hiding any faults because if there's anything not right with them, you shouldn't have them there. Because you only, you only hide a fault once, and when they get them home and they find a fault, they'll not come back the next year and buy your sheep again. So you're really just killing the goose that laid the golden egg. Used to be a bigger one as this, the Rothbury one. That's where we used to sell our ewes before we come here. It's a big, big mart. There was a full day of cheviots once upon a time, and then there was another day for the blackies. It was a big occasion at Rothbury, and then it was moved, it closed, and then we moved here. Sadly, I think we are seeing a, quite a, a dramatic change to, to the, the uh, way livestock is marketed. Um, all sorts of reasons for that, from environmental regulations to the economics of it, to the advent of um, selling um, uh, electronically. Um, so the need for as many markets, as many marts in and around the Cheviot Hills and, and the other upland areas is declining. And so I think sadly we will see fewer and fewer uh, auction marts around. Rothbury Mart almost certainly will not take place in the future and the likes of Bellingham uh, I think is, is doubtful as well. So quite a change in, in, in the, uh, uh, the future.
in the olden days, the shepherd had a few pack ewes of his own. And uh, it was part of his part of his wages. Some had three or four, and some had a few more. It's just one of them things. Proud of the tradition now. And I've had them since the world grew. And I've bred, uh, bred through the years with them and just bred some sure ones and I've been successful quite a bit with them. I know. I've won the overhead championship at yet I'm sure with a one one year and I've won Wooler sure, I've won most of the shows for the championships with them, different ones. But they're not easy bred to the sure ones. You just get one in a in a whale. Each of the shepherds, of course, would have their own pack of sheep um, that belonged to them, and they, the, the farmer would allow them to graze on his land, his or her land. But at the end of the year, that the shepherd then had that uh, pack of, of sheep to sell um, or to, to take to the show um, and uh, show against his, his neighbours. The tradition of having your own sheep, that um, the pride that you can uh, you have in those those individual sheep uh, uh, is something that's still really important to to the individuals. So, um, whilst many other things are changing, I think most shepherds today would still wish to have their own their own stock. You want to one with a good body and nice head, nice open horns and that. And now they have to be black. They're all got to be black, now, jet black. Once upon a time, they were a, we called them bell brow. They had a white bell on the on the face but now that tradition's gone they have to have black legs and black head now everybody's breeding them but with this black they're getting grey a bit of the face it's not as it's not as nice as it was really they look better i think the olden days when they were black and white but and uh, that's the way they want them now so they have to be black to sell them in the back end to the marshal gang, if the price is the ordeal, to celebrate they'll treat our pals, to your whiskey or a beer. But if the price is the or bad, it takes a drop to cheer, the canny shepherd laddie of the hills. Now the all gone down to Allington, to see the shepherd sure, and into foreman's pub at night you never fail to go for they sing the songs and dance the boot good fight god bless you know that's the canny shepherd laddie of the hills would jack mac williams please come to the secretary's caravan to collect his prize i think the agricultural shows are incredibly important to um, the hill shepherd and to the, the hill farming community Alwinton show in many ways is, is the, uh, the epitome of that in terms of the, it is the Border Shepherd show where um, you would have the shepherds coming from all over the, 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 the borders from across on the Scottish side to, uh, to compete with the sheep that they'd spent all, their life, uh, all that year working with. You'll have the, the farmer's classes and of course it's the shepherd that's actually produced the sheep and looked after them for the farmer's classes but then you've also got the um, um, the shepherds classes themselves, their, their own flock of sheep. Um, and so you've got b both the um, rivalry between the, the farms themselves, but also between the individual shepherds. It started as a shepherd's shoe, uh, and with an argument who had the best sheep in the work that's put into getting them trimmed up. It's like a lady getting ready for a dance. It's, it's, it's really, and they are good, mind. I mean, if you go down and look at the chivvy sheep down there and the, and the blackies, there's been a lot of work put into them to get them like what they are. That was, that's the top and bottom of it, to try and win the championship of the show, the best sheep in the show. But if you can win your class, you're doing well now. There isn't any money in it, there isn't any. It's just one of them things that you, you think you've got the best and the next man thinks he has the best. And that way it goes. Once upon a time, there was any amount of sheep coming to these shows. They used to drive them there in the olden days with their dogs. Come two or three days and stop two or three days beforehand. They saw went to show. It was a week's job coming and going from the show with the sheep. 
I stopped at a friend's house in the way across the hills and then I went on to the shore. Got there maybe the night before and had a few drinks and away I went into the shore field and then had a few drinks when the show was finished. Got back sometime in that next two or three days. There must have been hardy sheep that travelled to the shores, walked into the shores and that. There must have been good of their feet in that in them days. To travel to the shore and then keep them sound. And, because they would come across rough terrain and that to get there. Different now when you pull up with a trailer and a few in the back and you just let them out under a grass field. It must be a hell of a change. Uh, well, it's the local show, so, you know, you know quite a few people, you know, when you come. And it's just like, um, you know, all the community getting together and helping with the show, so it's quite good fun. It usually kind of takes a week, you know, to prepare for the cooking. It's a hobby, it's not, I don't take it very seriously, but um, it's, it's a nice hobby to have because you meet a lot of different people. Uh, um, well, this is the first time, first year I've showed drop scones. So uh, they're not, um, when I look at the other ones, they're quite uh, nice and round and mine's <laughs> not that perfect. But uh, no, it's just a bit of fun. <laughs> gingerbread. Um, I've, I've entered two this year, because um, there's usually a cup for the gingerbread. So uh, I thought if I entered two, I might get more of a chance. So, but this one a new recipe, so I haven't tried that one before. So we'll see how that goes. And then there's some rock, rock buns. So there's quite a few rock buns in there, so I wouldn't like to be the judge judging them, because uh, <laughs> it's quite a few to taste. But if you get a prize in Alwinson, you're very lucky. It's, you know, quite a lot of the experts, cooks, come and, you know, compete here. So they say if you get a prize at Alwinson, you're very, you know, you're doing very well. So I might end up with nothing. <laughs> Well, it's not really like, you know, crafts or anything like that. It's just really more, um, you know, just fun, just showing your, you know, your, your dog. We don't, you know, handle them professionally or we just take them around. Every judge is different, you know, they, they've got a particular type of dog they like. They might like right, rough-haired dogs or smooth-haired dogs or, you know, the t um, black, white and brown or just black and white, you know, clean black and white. It just all depends on the judge, really, what they like. So you just have to show your dog and hope he likes that type of dog. Uh, I didn't get anything. I did, well, he did pick me out. I was like fourth, but there's no fourth price. So, um, but I think she may be a bit lean. She's the type of dog I can never put weight on her, unless she might, you know, when, once she's matured. But uh, maybe that might have been it. Alwinton Show has been going for 139 years and I think there's always been a dog trail. I'm not sure about that, but so this is my 23rd Alwinton Show. The only year I haven't run here is the year of the foot and mouth. So it's certainly been going a long time. She's a dog I bought in June off a chap near Edinburgh. I've had her run her since then and she's getting better every time she comes out. She set off well, she gathered reasonably well off the right hand side, maybe a little tight. Uh, good start, good fetch, flanking all right, nice steady pace. Then on the drive away she lay down and forgot to get up. Hurry! 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 Wait me! But she did eventually get up, we got her gates. The cross drive, we had a bit of a hiccup, but we managed to get back and hit our gates again. Then I couldn't get her up on the sheep at the pen and the sheep just bolted away. So that was the end of the run. But we're getting there, we'll persevere and we'll get there. She's running well considering I've only had her five months, but I think another winter and she'll she'll be there or there about next year. She'll be picking up the odd price. Not say a lot, but the odd price. Oh, it's very high standards, you know, there's some very good cooks that enter. And, and there was quite a lot of entries this year as well, like, so I didn't win any. But, 
it was, you know, it's nice just thinking, oh, I might win something. Um, oh, I'll definitely come back. Yeah, try next year. I love Alden Show. Last show of the season, there's nothing on after this. End of the dog trailing season. It's been a long season, I'll be pleased to get a weekend at home now and work on with a dog. As you can see today we've got a bit of snow but not too much we can get about with the, the four wheel bikes. If we get a lot more we tend to go out and spread out hay to all the sheep on the farm. They're getting away without hay today. They've all got blocks to go at. But uh, it's usually a quiet time of year. It all depends what the weather does. There are just a few old ewes that we've kept back and we're fattening to sell later on. And we're just feeding them just to try and get them fat, really, that's all. It's uh, mainly black faced sheep here, but we've got a cross swale and a chief, North Country chief, and they're used to born and bred in the hills and used to the hill weather. Hey, lads. Come on. They're getting cake and pay every day and there's a block for them to chew it through the night, so they're getting plenty of feed. There's just not enough ground round about here to keep them all. We have a shed there, but we couldn't get all the sheep in there, so they just have to fend for themselves as best they can. Well, they just try to get down to grass in below the snow. They, they have what we call in this countryside ball snoots, which are tufts of grass which stick up above the snow and they'll tend to scratch away at them and get a bit feed at the base of the, the bull snoot. And it's just really feed themselves, that's what they're doing. And they don't need that much extra, but they do tend to care a lot for themselves now. I wouldn't like to manage out here without a bike now. It's a big lump of ground to go around and we'd never manage without the four wheel bike now. The introduction of the, the quad bike, a four-wheeled bike, um, has been quite a revolution um, for hill farming and, and shepherding. Um, it's not many years ago at all, I mean literally ten years or so ago, when most shepherds got round their hill uh, on foot or maybe on horseback. Um, now every single farm will have quad bikes and uh, of course this reduces the time it takes to see to the flock, to, uh, to gather um, and lessens the need for as many shepherds uh, in the hills. It was different then because you had to walk to the hill. He didn't ride around in a quad. He had to walk there and walk back. The quantity of land that everybody's got to cover now, the quad bike's the answer, I would say. As long as you don't come to any grief on it, on these hills, because they're dangerous things. But they're definitely the answer for getting from A to B quick. Instead of one man doing 500 sheep, which was adequate to get the proper uh, results from the sheep, they're putting 1,000, 1,200, 1,500 on one man. And he cannot, under any circumstances, handle 1,500 sheep by himself. So he gets a motorbike and he gets round them that way. A lot of these sheep are, are uh, herded with motorbikes and they're not got the same feel for people or dogs. But when you're sitting on a motorbike, you can't do the shepherding properly. The best way to shepherd sheep is to walk them and you see all your sheep individually. It affects the dogs too. You're better walking, seeing your sheep and handling your dogs better. Now they're on quad bikes a different type of dog is being bred to the one the shepherds bred. The type of dog that's being bred off these dogs isn't tested. It, it doesn't have to have tremendous stamina because it's, it's got a taxi waiting for it and it doesn't have to have intelligence because um, it doesn't have to think and solve problems unaided. 
and this is very sad. You can get around faster, but my argument is it's still the same amount of ground to cover. Uh, modern technology with the motorbikes, that's done away with a lot of shepherds. A lot of shepherds have been done away with and not been replaced either. When we lose the shepherds, we not only lose the dogs, but we lose all the skills that the shepherd had as well. For instance, uh, making beautiful crooks, uh, playing beautiful music, writing poetry, um, that's all gone. I think there's a number of crafts that are associated with, with shepherding and of course the, the most obvious is stick dressing, something that originally was purely a functional thing, um, you, you needed a stick to, to catch your sheep, um, but it's been recognised more and more as, as, as an art form. Nowadays I, I guess fewer shepherds are actually taking part in that, um, in that tradition. You want a stick so you use it as a walking stick. I'm making some just now. You can get a holly shank in that, it's quite nice, but it's heavy. The lighter the stick, the better. And you want white hazels to make them with, if you can get them. Them white ones that are harder is what the dark hazel is. Dark places, that's where they grew up, the river sides and things like that. And still, I see the wood on the roadside once, coming back from a farm, and it was a top just went back and cut it on the roadside. I was lucky because somebody else would have seen it and have been away with it. In the winter nights, just walk away them till you get sick of them and then back up, then come back and start again. But I've always been keen of working on my tools and doing things like that. But I've, I've learned a lot myself, even picked up off me own mistakes. But the chivvy horn makes a good stick. And then I was working on with a good horn out there today. It's just, doesn't make a full stick, it makes a, you put it on the half or head. But it looks nice when it's finished. You just heat them with a blue torture. There's a lot of ways that you can bend them. As long as you don't do it too fast, spoil them. Put them in the vise and straighten them, and, and then you file them out and put them into shape. Now, there's a lot of things you look at. Well, to see how it's finished and how straight it is, and how it's jointed on the horn, the horn jointed on the wood. And, and balanced straight, you know, so it's not heavy and top heavy the front. And not really fancy ones. I put a dog on them and different animals, horses' heads on them and things like that, and fish. Made a few fish sticks. I've had a one for donkeys I've used at the dog trails. And odd times people say, can I borrow your stick because they haven't got a one? And I says, no, I would never give them a lend of it because they'll just go and break it and that would be the end of that. It's called the Harbottle Shepherd's Supper. It's just really a get together of the hill men before lambing starts. Just a chance, one last chance to blow off steam before we get down to the nitty gritty of lambing time. My involvement is I get all the speakers, the two guest speakers, two singers, a piper, a comedian stroke accordionist. I organise, organise all them to come tonight, then I organise all everybody else, tell them when it's on, what time it starts and get there as quick as they can. We like a nice meal before we sit down to an evening's entertainment and the landlady of the store does us justice. She provides a very nice meal and a very reasonable cost, I might add. <laughs> cool. It's Peter Tweedy, that. Yeah. Uh, my neighbour on the Scotch side is playing the Scotch pipes, the small pipes, not the bagpipes, the small pipes. They're a bit 
like the Northumbrian pipes, but you blow them, you don't play them with your elbow sort of style. We'll meet them about four or five times a year. Let the fencemen or shepherd and the sheep or gather them or whatever. And it's just we're at the right time at the right place. We we'll quite often see them in the distance, or they'll see us in the distance, but it's very seldom we meet. I would say the biggest half of the audience tonight will be working shepherds. The biggest half. Oh, they enjoy the night. <laughs> they enjoy the night. <laughs> tonight, when you look round the hall, the average age will be pushing 50. It will be. There's not many youngsters coming into the job now. If there's anybody would like to go to the toilet or buy you a drink, I'll play while you're away. <laughs> Mungo Riddle is a comedian. He plays the accordion as well. Very, very scotch. He might be bad to understand, but he's very, very funny. I've heard him before. Very funny man. We'll start with some sing along ins that I didn't ken the words to, so you know. <laughs> Seeing different faces from what you see at work every day and chance to get a bit crack with your mates. Everybody seemed to enjoy it and I hope it continues. Meg? Meg, somewhere about eight, eight and a half months, somewhere about that. No, she's doing quite well. She's a wee bit headstrong. She's taken a little bit more handle than I would like, but she, she'll make the grade, I think. She just got good balance on her sheep. And when they stay locked on the sheep and, and not jump about and flap up and down and that, it's good balance. She's got good balance, her. Oh, well, she's had amount of power in her. And that's a built-in ability a dog has. If it's got power, it's got power, and if it hasn't, it hasn't. If you haven't got power and concentration in them, the, the sheep will just play with you. Because they can read it straight away in a dog what what its ability is, whether it can move them or, or they can just play with the dog. But if you get a one where control power, that's steady and, and plenty of power to move sheep, that's the one you want. Some of them's easy trained and that one hasn't been easy put into place because she's always tried to get a step further on you. But uh, the secret of it is just to get the right kind of dog that'll listen and a good stopper. And, and some of them is and some of them isn't. That's all there's to it. Well, it's January and um, we just uh, started to doze the ewes and then put them back to the hill because they've been in like most of them's been in for tipping time. So we get them in and doze them for fluke and uh, do their feet and just have a look at them and check see if everything's all right. Well, we've got this uh, problem on the farm, uh, spirochetes, it's a new type of foot rot. And uh, at one time, you used to pair the hoof with a knife and a little dab of that purple spray and that was it cured. But it's not as easy as that now. Um, it takes a lot of clearing up this spirochetes. It tends to rot the whole hoof round about the, the cleat and you have to cut that back and then spray it. But it's, it's every time we have the sheep in the pens, more or less, we're at their feet now. And it's uh, it's not been too bad this year. We, we, last year, I should say, it's been a dry year. That dried it up a little bit, but it's, it's still here. Mm -hmm. Very little pain. No, very little pain. It's just like cutting your own toenails. Very little pain. The you see the sheep sometimes kick when you're doing it, but it's just because they're not sitting right. Well, 
I would give them another dose, a mineral dose, not all of them, just any lean ones. So if there's any lean user, I give them a mineral dose. And Stuart was them for the fluke. They go really lean and uh, they usually get like a swelling under their, under their jaw and uh, it just uh, attacks the liver. Sometimes we have a bit of problem with, um, they call it new forest disease, just in the eyes, their eyes kind of go really cloudy and they can go blind with it. So we just give them an the ointment in the eye just to make it better. Medicines are far better today than they were 100 years ago, but they've got to be because sheep are more concentrated on the hill. This hill that we've had in today, there's about 280. You'd be lucky if there was 150 on 100 years ago. So there used to be a, a shop down at Alwinton, there used to be a, a school in the valley. They're all shut because there's no kids in the valley now. There's, as I say, there used to be seven shepherds here, but down to two. So, big changes from 100 years ago. Plus the weather. We never seem to get the winters we had, had years going by. One of the difficulties that perhaps shepherds will experience in the future is a lack of experience of, of hard winters. It's almost inevitable that at some point in the future we'll have a, a difficult winter, we'll have that lambing storm, um, that, that uh, fall of snow at a particular time that um, will cause lots of problems. And if you don't know your hill very well and you don't know how the sheep will react, um, depending on which way the weather uh, has come from, which way the wind is blowing, I think you could suddenly find yourself having major problems. Whatever happens in future winters, the Cocod Valley's current stock of shepherds is about to be depleted even further as a result of a surprise decision by Stuart and Gwen. Uh, we're moving away from Blindburn on March the 20th. Uh, Stuart's got another job over in Dumfries. Um, so we're going to have a big move over there. Too good a job to miss. The job here is getting a bit too much for me. So, chance of a good job working for the Duke of Buccleuch up at Dumfries. 1,000 ewes and 200 hogs. Semi-retirement, I think, for me, I think. <laughs> I'm hoping to still still be shepherding, you know, at this part-time work for me. As long as I can keep my dogs and run my dogs, I'll be happy and do some shepherding. We've got all the emails and things like that, these computers that you can keep in contact with now, you know, which is a lot cheaper and you know, easier to use. I'll be back for the shows. Definitely coming back for the Shepherd's Supper next year. We'll be back and forward more. We'll make new friends over there, but we'll still keep our old friends over here. As long as the people are very nice there, than what they are over here, I'll be happy. Meanwhile, down at the village pub, there's a special moment. To bring Stuart luck in his new job, Dave's presenting the Shepherd with one of his much treasured crooks. Yes, yes, take you've asked for for about 20 years, do you? <laughs> I hope it's lucky. I hope so as well, David. Thank uh, you very much. Well, uh, Lammer. Yeah, new job. New job, new stick. Right. That'll fell Lammer too up for the Duke of a clue. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good stick, It's that. strong, I don't take you a bracket. Oh, you want a bet? Oh, you might. <laughs> but uh, I'll put a, a bit of metal in you can re when you like. Thank you very much, David. Right. Here's for the stick. Yes, David. Thank you. Got away to hide it. <laughs> Dave has spent half a century looking after farm animals of all kinds. But now, at the age of 65, he's reluctantly decided it's time to retire from full time shepherding. Mm. It, it comes along, to, it happens to everybody. It's just been a way of life. I've been quite happy, Shepard. That's what I wanted to do, so that's what I did. And that's the best thing about it, and I've had some good times out of it. Done my part with it. Let somebody else do it now. There'll always be people to look after the sheep, or but I don't know at the end of the day what will happen because there isn't many young ones getting trained and they're just getting less and less. As long as there's sheep around, there will be shepherds, but um, there's few, few and far between now. Like, 
um, on the farms. There's quite there's one or two contract shepherds where the farmer just gets them in for certain times of the year, but um, I don't know where the where the, the new generation is going to come from. Things will will never be the same. They'll never be as I knew them. But at the same time, I am so pleased that I was born soon enough to see the wonderful work that the shepherds did, the humour and the laughter and the fun. Been here about five weeks and we're right in the middle of lambing time now. And the name of the farm now is called Glen Borgen. I've been told, several people's told me this in fact, it's the best farm in the valley and it's got some beautiful Joe. fields about the place. I've got a, a stick of my friend Davy Baxter to do the lambing with and I have used it and it's, it's a good catching stick. And it's still in one piece. I've not broke it yet. <laughs> well, it's um, it's different and uh, takes a bit to get used to, but it's quite exciting because everything is, you know, different and new, and uh, just finding Jump. things Jump. out, and so it's quite Jump. quite exciting. I mean, the first week we were on Lamon here, we had cold and rain every day, but the sun's come out and it's grass is growing and things are getting better as we go on. It's nice at the end of lambing time when the sun's out and the lambs are running about dancing and playing. Going round the hill, setting sheep in in the morning, out at night. They're going out in the line and there's a lamb following each ewe. It's a nice sight. Makes it all worthwhile. <laughs> 